Your name is Walter Burlett. You live in the shadows of the Rockies, and you make your living in part as a naturalist. But long ago, you've put aside the rifle in favor of the camera. For stalking wild game with a lens can be just about as exciting as a hunt with a Remington. You've photographed the Rocky Mountain Grizzly. You've scaled the steep slopes in pursuit of the bighorn ram. But now, far to the north, a new star is born. A new challenge beckons. Alaska, the last frontier. But a frontier with modern conveniences. Thriving Anchorage, for example, has two television stations, three radio stations, three newspapers, and the busy air of any prosperous American city. But your destination is far beyond Alaska's growing cities. You seek the wilds where few men travel, and where Alaskan wildlife is as it has been for centuries. The quickest way to get there is by light plane. The bush pilot knows this country like a cab driver knows Times Square. There are few landing strips or airfields, only open tundra. Your heart sinks as the plane heads for a section of rocky beach. But the skill of the pilot and the rugged nylon reinforced tires combine for a perfect landing. You make a final check of your equipment, your camera, your lightweight rugged clothing of Dacron, Orlon, and nylon, your food supplies, and now you are alone. For the bush pilot is off to another rendezvous. You look at the awesome grandeur of the Alaskan wilderness and recall the words of Robert Service. There's a land where the mountains are nameless and the rivers all run God knows where. There are lives that are erring and aimless and deaths that just hang by a hair. There are hardships that nobody reckons. There are valleys unpeopled and still. There's a land, oh, it beckons and beckons and I want to go back and I will. But a photographer is never alone for long. A pair of mallard ducks spot the lens and come to have their picture taken. The Alaskan beaver shows off his swimming skill. A gull displays its wing spread, and a Jaeger preens and pretties up for a picture. A yellow leg spreads its wings against the warm Chinook wind. The ever busy bee has no time for posing as it collects the pollen from the many beautiful flowers that grace the rolling green hillsides. The hungry Alaskan mosquitoes make life miserable for man and beast, but modern insect repellent in a pressurized Freon container sends them elsewhere quickly. You don a durable nylon jacket, shoulder your camera equipment, and move downstream toward the Toklat River. There, a lonely Alaskan sourdough tends his primitive fish trap. The rickety structure, a relic of the past, is a crude method of catching an occasional salmon. The ever-present midsummer sun is no clue to passing hours. You realize suddenly that it is 11 o'clock in the evening, although the Arctic sun still plays a magnificent color rhapsody on the distant slopes. Here in summer, daylight lasts 20 hours around the clock. You make camp, build a fire, eat an outdoorsman's dinner, smoke a quiet pipe, and turn in. The temperature drops quickly in Alaska, and you're thankful for the warm, lightweight sleeping bag of Dacron fiber fill to shield you against the chill of the short Arctic night. You get an early start the next day, and luck is with you. You spot a distant herd of caribou. You approach downwind. They sense your presence, and curiosity aroused, cautiously move toward you. Caribou travel ceaselessly from one end of the Alaskan Peninsula to the other, always searching out the reindeer moss and the slow-growing lichen on which they feed. In days gone by, 
There were millions of caribou, and their migration across the Yukon River would hold up for hours the passage of the paddle wheel steamers pushing upstream. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, an ever alert bull panics and off they bound, covering the tundra at a running speed of close to 50 miles an hour. The herd leaves you far behind, so you grind off a portrait of the happy-go-lucky Alaskan fox, the Wilson warbler, the yellow-bellied porcupine, the Alaskan comedian. All at once, there's tension in the air. Suddenly you see why, a toke like grizzly. In this wilderness, it's eat and be eaten, the survival of the fittest. And this 700 pounds of tooth and claw is the strongest, meanest, and fittest of them all. Your friends beat a hasty retreat. But there is no place for you to go, no trees to climb, and the bear can run faster than you can. You crouch behind your tripod in a cold sweat of fear. You have to make a move. Your piercing yell breaks the silence, and your hunch pays off. Rather than face the unknown, the bear lumbers off down the slope. With the danger past, you head for higher ground and pick up the elusive doll sheep. These sharp-scented, quick-eyed doll sheep are distant cousins of the Rocky Mountain Bighorn. At the first sound of a distant plane, the herd gets restless and starts moving out. It's a relief to see the plane return right on schedule. For without this aerial taxi, you'd be stuck here with no means to get out. For the tundra is too boggy for walking, and the river is too wide to cross without boat or canoe. The bush pilot lands on water this trip, so you pack your gear and head for the river. Don Sheldon, the pilot, is a man of action, and by the time you reach him, he has landed a 20-pound king salmon. You join Don using light tackle and the new super strong Stren nylon line for the best freshwater fishing you've ever enjoyed. Soon you're airborne again, this time headed for the jagged coast of Alaska and the foggy Pribilof Islands. On the way, you pass over one of the many Alaskan gold mines, where the miners are literally washing away the mountain to extract the precious ore. On the jagged cliffs of the Pribilof, Thousands of birds make their homes. These frisky, chattering denizens of the Bering Sea find the vast Arctic feeding grounds to their liking. The tufted puffin, the crested auklet, the cormorant are but a few of the many species of bird life found in the Privilots. Nearby is the sanctuary and breeding grounds of the famed Alaskan fur seal. Here, 300 miles north of the Aleutians, 80% of all the fur seals in the world return each summer to breed and rear their young. The young bulls gather their own harems, sometimes numbering as many as 50 cows. You try to be friendly and admire one of the new arrivals, but the master of the harem won't stand for any nonsense in his family. So you send Junior back to Mama and Daddy lets you off with a final word of warning. Each mother seal knows instinctively which pup is her own. Dad, thinking that all is well, fans himself in the sun, but not for long. For it seems that Mama has wandered off, and a baby seal separated from its mother cannot survive. Where's Mama? Perhaps this handsome sea lion has caught her eye but Dad's on the job and won't put up with any shenanigans from any of his wives. In the Privilofs, it's strictly a man's world. Mama is sent back to her duties, and after a short family spat, all is forgiven. All of this sentiment is too much for this battle-scarred veteran, who has had enough of this Privilof soap opera and heads for the quiet of the sea. Once almost exterminated by the fur hunters, the herds are now protected by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Each year, the herd is carefully harvested, and the 100,000 pelts bring close to $7 million a year. 
You're pretty well pleased with yourself. Got a lot of footage you came for, but Don Sheldon, the bush pilot, has promised you a spectacular plane ride. A dangerous rendezvous 100 miles away, 12,000 feet into the Alaskan mountains, with urgent supplies for a small band of mountain climbers. Soon the green, hilly tundra dissolves into broad glacial rivers, jagged rocks and snow. Now, more than 10,000 feet above sea level, you skim the tops of unnamed peaks, the wingtips of the light plane flirting dangerously with the raw mountainside. You find the climbers on a broad plateau of snow. These experienced climbers are making the first assault in four years on the highest mountain in North America, Mount McKinley. The pilot sets the plane down gently on the runway the climbers have marked for him. The rarefied atmosphere at this altitude saps an unbelievable amount of strength from even veteran climbers like these. They have to depend exclusively on lightweight gear. New self-contained nylon tents that pop open and shut in a matter of seconds weigh less than five pounds. This lightweight nylon rope is the only kind these climbers now use. It's strong and is not weakened by mildew or rot. New sleeping bags, insulated with Dacron polyester fiber fill, weigh less than seven pounds. Underwear, also insulated with Dacron fiber fill, requires only a thin windbreaker and a pair of lightweight wind pants for outerwear. The rumble that breaks the still quiet of these desolate peaks means avalanche. A constant threat of sudden death, yet a sight of awesome beauty. Mission accomplished. You and the bush pilot head for home. It takes all the manpower and horsepower available to get you airborne again. It will be several days before the climbers will see their goal. But for you, the top of the great peak will loom into view minutes after takeoff. The majestic summit of Mount McKinley, 20,300 feet of rock, ice, and windswept snow, conquered yet raw and untamed. A challenge still to man and progress, typical of Alaska itself. Our 49th state where raw frontier and the 20th century live side by side in a booming, thriving, promising land where the mountains are nameless, and the rivers all run God knows where. There are valleys unpeopled and still, and I want to go back, and I will.